The hardest choices require the strongest will. Marvel is the most successful film franchise in history. Every single one of its movies have become hits, bringing in 22 billion worldwide. Competing franchises have yet to even come close to beating that number, including Star Wars, Harry Potter, and James Bond. However, Marvel wasn't always recognized as the greatest. Pizza time. In fact, the company was once seen as embarrassing and even shunned and casted out by many. Things didn't start to change until an assistant who fetched coffees and swept floors for $8 a week came up with the idea of creating new and unlikely superheroes. They weren't perfect, good looking, and athletic like traditional superheroes. Instead, they were flawed and had problems and weaknesses like regular people. When the assistant pitched one of his most imperfect superhero ideas to his boss, he was told it was the worst idea ever. Convinced his boss was wrong, the assistant went behind his back and secretly released a comic to debut his new and unlikely superhero. That superhero is now voted the most popular in the world. This is the story of how an assistant turned Marvel from a company seen as a joke to a multi-billion dollar empire. If you have an idea that you genuinely think is good, don't let some idiot talk you out of it. Stan Lieber was born in 1922 to Romanian-born Jewish immigrants Jack and Celia. Jack worked as a garment cutter and Celia worked as a retail saleswoman. With help from relatives, the Lieber family managed to live in a small apartment in Manhattan, New York. Growing up, the Lieber family struggled to make ends meet, especially after Jack lost his job during the Great Depression, forcing them to move to an even smaller apartment in the Bronx. Over time, Jack and Celia grew distant from each other, both constantly anxious and arguing about money. My father was not a good businessman and he was not lucky. Most of the time, he couldn't find a job. I felt so sorry for him. Ever wonder how you can become a lord or lady? With today's video sponsor, established titles, you or a loved one can. In the past, there were really only a handful of ways that were out of reach for most. You would have to be born into it, marry into it, or be appointed in the UK by the Prime Minister and the Queen. But today, thanks to a Scottish custom, you too can call yourselves a lord or a lady by owning a small plot of land in Scotland through established titles. You can even get your new title on your credit cards, plane tickets, or simply your dating profile. Plus a certificate with a unique plot number to identify the exact location of your land. You can also gift a title to your loved ones for special occasions like Mother's Day. It makes for an extra special gift considering a tree is planted with every order. Whether it's for you or a loved one, acquire a Lord or Lady title by going to EstablishedTitles.com slash hook, and you'll get an extra 10% off. Having suffered many hardships from his father's unemployment, Stan developed a strong work ethic and worked various odd jobs, from selling newspapers to delivering sandwiches. When he wasn't working, he avoided the tension at home by reading anything and everything, hoping to one day become a famous novelist like Mark Twain. After graduating from high school early at 16, Stan decided to not attend college to find work and support his family instead. Fortunately, it wasn't long until he found a job as an assistant for a publishing company owned by his cousin, Martin Goodman, called Timely. There, Stan fetched coffees and sandwiches, swept the floors, proofread stories, and edited drawings for $8 a week. 
One year later, Timely began to ask Stan for his opinion on the stories they were working on, whether or not he liked them, and what he would change about them. To Stan's surprise, Timely took some of his suggestions. They even asked him to write a comic for their Captain America series, where a patriotic super soldier battles against spies, fifth columnists, and propagandists. In the episode that Stan worked on, he came up with the idea of giving the super soldier a signature move, the ricocheting shield toss. From then on, Stan began to write a variety of stories for Timely, including romance, mystery, and horror, and was promoted to editor at just 18. However, Stan still hoped to become a novelist and started using the fake surname Lee. He was scared that publishing companies would choose to not publish his novels if they knew he wrote comics. I realized that people had no respect for comic books at all. Most parents didn't want their children to read comics, and I was a little embarrassed to be doing the work that I did, Stan later admitted. Enjoying the video so far? Be sure to subscribe to Hook and ring the bell to stay up to date with new stories about today's most successful companies. Despite Stan's insecurity about writing comics, he had a knack for it and continued up until World War II began. Stan decided to voluntarily enlist in the army and was assigned to fix communications equipment and telegraph poles. But after making a mistake on the job, he was moved to the training film division where he lucked out writing manuals, slogans, and even films. After the war ended, Stan returned to Timely and was promoted to editor of the comics operation. Around this time, Stan also married a woman named Joan. Together, they had two children. First, Joan, and later, Jan. Sadly, Jan passed away three days after she was born. Doctors told Joan that she could not bear any more children. Stan and Joan then tried to adopt but were dismissed by agencies because of their different religions. After giving up on growing his family, Stan threw himself into work, churning out one story after another. Timely, now renamed Atlas, business model prioritized quantity over quality, and trend chasing over trend creating. Whatever was selling at the moment, Atlas would publish books in that genre. We were never leaders in the field, we always followed the trends. While Atlas' business model proved to be successful, there was one operation they were forced to slow down. Comics. At the time, many parents complained that comics were bad for children since some were filled with violence and bloody details. They worried such comics would influence their children in dangerous ways and some organized public comic burnings. Publishing companies like Atlas didn't take their complaints too seriously and continued business as usual. Up until one book shook the entire industry overnight. Seduction of the Innocent In the book, author and child psychologist Dr. Wortham claimed that violence committed by children was on the rise and that they were connected to reading comics. More parents and even politicians became convinced that comics were bad for children, leading to some stores to stop selling them and congressional hearings on whether or not to outlaw them. Comic sales were slashed and dozens of publishing companies shut their doors. The remaining companies did their best to survive by funding the Comics Code Authority, which ensured comics didn't include stories that would upset parents or politicians. If a comic was approved, it could use a seal of approval on its cover to let people know it was safe for children to read. Six years later, Atlas managed to stay in business. However, few of the original team remain. By then, Stan had been with the company for two decades and felt it was now time to leave. He missed the good old days with his former colleagues and found writing for Atlas was no longer fun. The CCA and rise of television drove many creatives away from the industry and made the work less exciting. As Stan walked into Martin's office to deliver the news, he was given a new assignment before he could get a word in creating a comic book featuring a group of superheroes to compete with DC's Justice League of America. Justice League had seven superheroes who fought villains as a team. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, 
and the Martian Manhunter. While Stan was excited by the idea, he still had thoughts of leaving Atlas. None of the stories he had written for Atlas had taken off, and he had felt like he was wasting his talent. I was feeling like a DJ in a small town. Is anybody listening? Did anybody care? I felt like I was a better writer and that I shouldn't be wasting my life on this. Unsure of what to do next, Stan turned to his wife, Joan, for advice. Do one last book the way you want to. You want to quit anyway, so what have you got to lose? Joan pointed out. Stan agreed with Joan. If he took too much of a risk and disappointed Martin, it wouldn't matter because he had already planned to leave. But if he created something special that pleased him, he might be able to recreate the good old days when Atlas was named Timely. As Stan thought about it more, an idea for a new group of superheroes quickly came to mind. Unlike Superman and Captain America, they would not be perfectly good looking or incredibly strong. Instead, they would have problems and weaknesses like everyday people. At the time, this was unheard of since publishing companies continued to target children instead of an older audience, and the characters they created had little depth. To flesh out his idea, Stan turned to one of the comic writers and artists who co-created Captain America, Jack Kirby. Together, the two built on Stan's idea and co-created the Fantastic Four. The Fantastic Four were four astronauts named Reed Richards, Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, and Ben Grimm. All of them formed different superpowers after being exposed to cosmic rays. Reed became Mr. Fantastic, who could stretch to incredible lengths. Susan Storm became the Invisible Woman, who could make herself and objects invisible. Johnny Storm became the Human Torch, who could engulf his body in flames. And Ben Grimm became Thing, who transformed into stone and could smash opponents. One year later, the first Fantastic Four comic book was released. To Stan's surprise, it was an instant hit. Sales figures were Atlas best in years, and for the first time, the company received fan mail from an older audience. For many of them, the Fantastic Four were the first superheroes they could relate to since they faced real-world problems like bickering with family and dealing with breakups. Stan now felt more confident about writing comics. He and Jack then came up with an idea for another comic book, The Incredible Hulk. Inspired by Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and Frankenstein, the Hulk featured a soft-spoken scientist named Dr. Bruce Banner, who turned into an uncontrollable green monster whenever he felt panicked or lost his temper. The Hulk used his superpowers like unlimited strength to protect them from villains. However, he was often misunderstood by the public and persecuted by authorities, leading to being alienated by the very society he fought for. When the first Hulk comic book was released, it was an instant hit and marked as the few darker, conflicted, and more human comic books. Many fans could relate to Dr. Banner's frustrations over having to suppress his rage, while others welcomed the comic becoming an anti-establishment trend. As comics changed to be more reflective in many ways, Stan felt that Atlas should as well and convinced Martin to change the name to Marvel, one of the company's early comic titles. By then, Stan had worked his way up from assistant to writer to editor-in-chief. He could ask the artist to work on anything he needed, but still sometimes struggle to get Martin to understand his ideas. However, he remained persistent in trying even when Martin told him his new idea was the worst he had ever heard of. A teenager who gets bitten by a radioactive spider and develops spider-like superpowers. What's the matter with you? Martin balked. Teenagers can only be sidekicks and people hate spiders. Stan tried to convince Martin otherwise, but it was no use. Martin strictly ordered him not to pursue his idea. Stan reluctantly agreed. And then thought of a plan B. After Martin rejected Stan's idea, Stan couldn't help but think about it even more. Normally he would have let it go, but this time he couldn't. 
Eager to at least try to put his idea out, Stan secretly asked artist Steve Ditko to create his new superhero and then slipped the story into a comic book that was being discontinued. Amazing fantasy. We were set to do one last issue and nobody cared what you put inside a book that was about to be killed, Stan later revealed. The story, named Spider-Man, featured a geeky teenager named Peter Parker who was unsure of himself and got bullied by a football star. After being bitten by a radioactive spider, Peter develops spider-like superpowers and uses them to fight crime across New York, taking on the name Spider-Man. A few months later, Marvel unexpectedly hit a huge milestone, having a bestseller in a decade. Every copy of Amazing Fantasy was sold, thanks to Stan and Steve Spider-Man. Many fans saw a bit of themselves in Peter, relating to his everyday struggles like being awkward and unpopular, not being liked by many girls, and having trouble paying rent. When Martin discovered the news about Amazing Fantasy's sales figures, he hurriedly ran over to Stan. Remember that idea we liked about Spider-Man? Let's make a series, he insisted. Stan didn't hesitate to take him up on his offer and together with Steve created a series for Marvel's new official superhero. From then on, Stan came up with ideas for more unlikely superheroes with help from other Marvel writers and artists. Over the next few years, the group managed to introduce several new superheroes, most notably Thor, Ant-Man, X-Men, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, Daredevil, Black Widow, and Black Panther. Like the Fantastic Four, Hulk, and Spider-Man, each one had unique powers and abilities but problems and weaknesses like everyday people. What made them even more special was that they were metaphors for the civil rights movement, driving home messages of tolerance and acceptance while rejecting demonization and bullying. With Marvel having changed the comic industry while making more money than ever, Martin decided it was now time to retire and sell the company. When word got out, a businessman named Martin Ackerman approached him with a generous offer, 15 million in cash. Martin Goodman agreed to accept his offer under one condition, Stan had to remain in charge. Martin Ackerman obliged and Stan was promoted to publisher. As Marvel's new publisher, Stan began to think of fresh ideas for the company beyond new, unlikely superheroes. He wanted to bring Marvel's characters to life in ways that had never been done before, getting them featured on TV and in movies. Fortunately, it wasn't long until his ambitious plans would come to fruition. Marvel soon negotiated a deal that involved licensing the characters with the largest and most profitable studio in Hollywood. Universal. Not long after, Universal decided to create a TV series featuring the Hulk. Meanwhile, Stan continued on his pursuit of making his mark in Hollywood. He hoped to find producers who could turn Marvel's comic series into movies. But to his surprise, each one that he approached turned him down. At the time, producers believed it would be too difficult to show drawn comic actions using real actors. Yet, somehow, DC still managed to beat Marvel in getting to the silver screen and made a fortune. Their movie, Superman, brought in 300 million worldwide and became the sixth highest grossing film ever. Rather than be disappointed, Stan was thrilled. Producers were now convinced that superhero movies could work. Stan didn't wait around for producers to call. Instead, he quickly set up meetings and even moved his family to Los Angeles. Marvel's new owner, New World, doubted that Stan could pull it off, but Stan proved them wrong. He managed to convince producers to create movies for The Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and The Punisher. However, over the coming years, Stan realized that would be the easy part. Producers often argued and sometimes sued each other, and the writers were ordered to rewrite scripts countless times. In the end, no one was satisfied, and the movies were never released. Stan was taken aback by the struggles in Hollywood. He would soon discover that was the least of Marvel's worries. After Marvel's new owner, Ron Perlman, took the company public, it began to acquire several businesses to diversify the company, all of which cost $700 million. 
Ron had hoped to make up for the losses by raising the prices on comics, but his plans backfired. Many then found comics too expensive and stopped buying them at all. In fact, sales dropped by 70% and shares worth $35.75 dropped to a staggering $2.38. Marvel, once a consistently profitable company, was then forced to file for bankruptcy. Carrying Marvel's legacy was now beyond Stan and even Ron's control. For nearly two years, Marvel's banks, bondholders, subsidiaries, and other parties all fought for control over the business with different reorganization plans. Creditors voted to accept a plan by Marvel subsidiary Toy Biz, despite offering less in cash when compared to Ron since they had the best strategy and vision. Afterward, Toy Biz co-founder Avi Arad became Marvel's CEO. However, after one year, Avi stepped down to allow Peter Cuneo, a businessman known for researching companies, to take over. Meanwhile, Avi became Marvel's chief creative officer and set out to revive the company's film division, Marvel Studios. At the time, Marvel Studios had yet to make their own films. Instead, it licensed characters but only managed to bring in a small percentage of profits due to bad deals made by previous management. For example, when New Line Cinema finally released Blade and grossed $131 million, Marvel only received $250,000. Two years later, Fox released X-Men and grossed $296 million. Marvel only received $26 million. One year later, Sony released Spider-Man and made $821 million marking the highest grossing superhero film at the time. Marvel only received 10 million and 5% of the gross box office revenue. After decades, Hollywood had finally recognized the true value of Marvel's characters. However, it came at the cost of devaluing its assets and heading towards more financial struggles. It was difficult for Marvel to watch the very people who doubted them cash in on their most valuable assets while they struggled to make payroll, even for outsiders like David Maisel. David was a talent agent who previously worked for the CAA at Disney and recognized that Marvel had untapped potential, so much that he pitched Avi an idea to help improve the company's returns, turn Marvel Studios into a real film studio to fund and produce its own films. David also suggested mixing characters in films so that each one could become a lead-in to the next, similar to Star Wars. Avi was intrigued. He had thought about the same idea during Marvel's bankruptcy, but hadn't figured out the financing as David did, using Marvel's characters as collateral in exchange for a loan. Confident David's ideas could work, Avi introduced David to Marvel's CEO, Isaac Perlmutter. Isaac and Marvel's board members told David to give his ideas a shot as their new COO, as long as they didn't have to put up a dime. Two years later, Marvel succeeded in getting a non-recourse loan from Merrill Lynch. Under the terms, Marvel would receive $525 million to make 10 films featuring various Marvel characters, including Ant-Man, The Avengers, Black Panther, Captain America, Doctor Strange, Hawkeye, Nick Fury, Power Pack, and Shang-Chi. If the first four films failed, Merrill Lynch would receive the film rights for the six characters but would have to pay a 5% fee for each film they produced. Even if the plan failed entirely, we were no worse off than our current situation, David later revealed. By the time the deal was announced, Stan had retired from Marvel but continued to act as the company's brand ambassador and offer the company advice. Three years later, Marvel finally released its first in-house film, Iron Man. The film was so successful that it led to Marvel being acquired by Disney and two Iron Man sequels over the next few years. The third Iron Man brought in 1.2 billion worldwide and became the second highest grossing film the year it was released. Five years later, Marvel released Black Panther and broke several box office records. The film brought in $1.3 billion worldwide and became the 10th highest grossing film in history. Later that same year, Marvel also released Avengers Infinity War. 
which became the first superhero movie to earn 2 billion worldwide. And more recently, Marvel released Shang-Chi. The film brought in 400 million worldwide and became the highest grossing movie amid the COVID pandemic. Then, after just a few months, Spider-Man No Way Home was released and grossed 1.7 billion worldwide, earning more than Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and Eternals combined. To date, Marvel is listed as the most successful film franchise in history and has grossed 22 billion worldwide. Competing franchises have yet to even come close to beating that number, including Star Wars, Harry Potter, and James Bond. As for Stan, he's now widely known as one of the most influential writers and publishers in the comic industry, along with being named the father of superheroes. He continued to act as Marvel's brand ambassador and serve as executive producer for many films, up until his passing at age 95. At a keynote event, Stan shared what mentality laid the foundation for his and Marvel's eventual success. If you have an idea that you genuinely think is good, don't let some idiot talk you out of it. Now, that doesn't mean that every wild notion you come up with is going to be genius, but if there is something that you feel is good, something you want to do, something that means something to you, try to do it. Because I think you can only do your best work if you're doing what you want to do, and if you're doing it the way you think it should be done. This is the story of how an assistant turned writer and publisher changed the world of comics and laid the foundation of building a multi-billion dollar empire. For more inspiring stories and advice from today's most successful leaders, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.